Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video and the next video, we're going to be looking at cardiac pressure volume loops. And this is actually one convenient way to look at all the phases of the cardiac cycle for a given chamber. And in this one, we're actually going to be using the left ventricle as an example. So here we're going to look at a very basic cardiac pressure volume loop. And then in the following video, we're going to see how changes in uh, contractility preload and afterload affect the shape of the cardiac pressure volume loop. So now let's take a look at this particular pressure volume loop. And we need to understand a few things before we get into the details of the cycle. One, which chamber is this referring to? And that's important because we've got four chambers of the heart, so we need to understand the context. Well, this one is obviously about the left ventricle because it tells us that in both the x and y axes. Second, we need to understand what the axes even are. So the horizontal axis right here is the left ventricular volume in milliliters. Units are a little bit less important, but basically this tells us the volume of blood in the left ventricle. Okay? And notice it's of course increasing going to the right. The vertical axis is the left ventricular pressure, or the pressure inside the left ventricle. Okay, so again, as we go up the vertical axis, the pressure is increasing. And the final thing we need to understand about the pressure volume loop is that it has direction. So do we go around this uh, counterclockwise or clockwise? Well, we go the directions the arrows tell us. So the arrows are important here, and they tell us that we're going to be going counterclockwise around this loop. Okay? Now, we can really start anywhere on here, but I'm really going to start here during this period of filling. So this is going to be the period during the cardiac cycle of the left ventricle when the left ventricle is filling with blood. And to really understand this, we're also going to take a look at this picture right here. So we're going to begin here in ventricular filling. Okay? So in ventricular filling, the ventricle is going to be in diastole. So it's relaxed, it's not contracting. We also need to understand the state of these two valves right here. Here's our aortic valve, is that open or closed? And here's our AV valve, more specifically mitral valve, is this open or closed? Now, in ventricular filling, the ventricle is filling with blood. So that means blood is coming from the left atrium and it's moving into the left ventricle. So in order for that to occur, this AV valve is going to have to be open. Okay? Now because the ventricle is relaxed, the aortic valve would have to be closed. And so if we go to this pressure volume loop, what we can see at point A, this is right when ventricular filling starts, the mitral valve, which is the AV valve on the left side of the heart, has to be open. And this is going to allow blood to move passively, due to gravity that is, from the left atrium into the left ventricle. If this AV valve were closed, then filling would not occur, so it's necessary that this be open. And so as long as this valve is open, filling can occur. And during this entire phase of ventricular filling, so period of filling of the left ventricle, this mitral valve or AV valve on the left side of the heart has to be open. As we go along this curve, notice what's happening. There's really no change in the left ventricular pressure, right? But notice the volume is increasing. So as soon as this mitral valve opens, that instant, we're approximately at 50 milliliters of blood. But as blood moves from the left atrium into the left ventricle, as we would expect, the volume of blood in the left ventricle increases. And it's increasing to approximately 120 milliliters right here. Now the question is right here, why does the filling stop? Well, it stops because the mitral valve closes. And why does the mitral valve close? Well, right here, at this point B, this is when the left ventricle begins to contract. However, remember from the cardiac cycle that when the left ventricle starts to contract, and really the right ventricle as well, that you do not immediately get ejection. There's a short period called isovolumetric contraction. And during isovolumetric contraction, both valves are closed, both the AV valve and in this case the aortic valve, or just the semilunar valve in general. They're both closed. So we're going to skip right over atrial systole and go directly to ventricular systole, and initially isovolumetric contraction. But right before we get to ventricular systole, or really isovolumetric contraction, right at this point, 
the AV valve is still open and the aortic valve is closed. When the left ventricle begins to contract, the pressure inside is going to increase. But initially, that increase in pressure is only going to be sufficient to close the AV valve. It's not yet high enough to open the aortic valve. In other words, it requires a much higher pressure to open the aortic valve than it does to close the AV valve. And so we're going to have a state momentarily where AV valve is closed and aortic valve is closed. And if we look at the pressure volume loop, we see right here the AV valve closes, okay, or mitral valve closes, and there's no change in volume because we're going directly vertically. Um, we're staying at about 120 milliliters, but notice as we go up, obviously the pressure is increasing. And during this phase between point B right here, and point C, which we'll talk about in a minute, this is called isovolumetric contraction. The ventricles are contracting, but the pressure is not yet high enough to open the aortic valve, but it is sufficient to close the AV valve, or mitral valve. And so it's isovolumetric. Why is that? Well, if both valves are closed, then the volume of blood inside the ventricle is going to be constant. The blood's not going to move anywhere. And so even though the pressure is increasing, the volume in here is not changing, so it's isovolumetric. Now eventually, the pressure generated by the left ventricle is going to be sufficient enough to open the aortic valve. And so when that happens, aortic valve opens, and the pressure is still going to be increasing, but notice that the blood is going to be ejected ultimately into the aorta. And so what we're going to see is not only is the pressure going to increase, but the volume inside the left ventricle is going to decrease. Why is it decreasing? Because the ventricle is ejecting blood out the semilunar valve, or in this case out the aortic valve, into the aorta. So increase in pressure and a decrease in volume. And so this curve right here represents ejection. Eventually you're going to get to a peak pressure inside the left ventricle, and then the pressure is going to start to drop a little bit, right? And eventually, as the pressure is dropping, the pressure is going to go beneath the pressure needed to keep the aortic valve closed, okay? Because remember, you have to have a sufficient pressure in order to open the aortic valve. So when the pressure starts to drop, it's not going to be sufficient enough to keep the aortic valve open, and so the aortic valve will close. And that's what point D here is. The aortic valve closes. Okay? So, right after ventricular ejection is done, we enter a period called isovolumetric relaxation. Now, again, right before we get to isovolumetric relaxation, so we're still in ventricular ejection, we're basically like right here on the curve. The AV valve is closed, in other words, the mitral valve is still closed, and the aortic valve is still open. And so that being said, blood is still going to be able to move from the left ventricle into the aorta. But as soon as this pressure drops a little bit more, again, the aortic valve closes. And so the mitral valve, or AV valve, is still closed. Now the aortic valve is closed. Both valves are closed. And considering now the ventricle is going to start relaxing, it's no longer an isovolumetric contraction, it's an isovolumetric relaxation. It's isovolumetric because the volume in the left ventricle is constant. Both of these valves are closed, so we can no longer have blood moving from the left atrium into the left ventricle, and blood cannot move from the left ventricle into the aorta. It's also during a, a ventricular diastole, and so the ventricle is relaxing. So this phase right here is isovolumetric relaxation. And considering it's relaxing, we would expect the pressure to decrease, right? Because if it's relaxing, it's going to go the opposite direction. The pressure is going to drop back down um, almost to zero. And then also the volume is constant. It's isovolumetric. So again, this vertical line, there's no change in volume. And that's going to take us back down to point A, where the mitral valve, or the AV valve, is going to open. And again, the AV valve opens because the pressure is low enough and it's insufficient to keep this valve closed. Okay. Now, there's a few other things that we can determine from this pressure volume loop. One is the end systolic volume. Then we have the end diastolic volume, and then the stroke volume, which can be determined from these two parameters. 
So first we have end systolic volume, or ESV. This is defined as the volume of blood remaining in the left ventricle after the contraction, so after systole, or right before the ventricle starts filling. So this is actually going to be the lowest volume of blood in the ventricle. And it's important to notice that the ventricle does not actually pump all the blood out. There's actually sort of a residual volume left, which is what the ESV is. And in this case, the ESV is about 50 milliliters. Okay? So in other words, if you look at the isovolumetric relaxation phase, whatever the volume is at that point, anywhere on this vertical line, that's the end systolic volume. Now again, the ventricle is going to fill with blood, and it's going to reach a maximum amount of blood. This is referred to as the end diastolic volume. In other words, the volume of blood in the left ventricle before any contraction occurs and after filling is complete. And in order for EDV to be accurate, it has to be after filling both through passive filling and atrial systole. So it's more important to think about this as being the volume of blood in the left ventricle right before contraction occurs. And whatever volume you're at on this vertical line, which is isovolumetric contraction, that's going to be your end diastolic volume. And so in this case, it's about 120 milliliters. And the end diastolic volume always has to be greater than end systolic volume because, of course, this is the volume of blood after it's filled. This is before it's filled over here after contraction. Okay. Now, we can also define something called the stroke volume, or SV. Stroke volume is the difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. You just take the difference. So if we estimate the end diastolic volume being about 120 milliliters, and end systolic volume being about 50 milliliters, we take the difference, and the stroke volume in this case would be about 70 milliliters. And so the stroke volume would be how much blood, what volume of blood, is pumped by the left ventricle per beat. Okay. And there are a lot of factors that we've talked about that can affect the stroke volume either in a negative fashion or a positive fashion. And so hopefully this pressure volume loop made sense to you. And in the next video, we're going to go over um, some variations of this and just see how different factors like increased preload and contractility and increasing afterload affect the shape of the pressure volume loop. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.